From Eustathius to his most dear Manuel, 10 books concerning Digenis Akritas and his parents. The first book of Digenis Akritas. My child, my most beloved and most dear child, many times you have excelled me with all your accomplishments by writing of Digenis Akritas, and having heard your words that stimulated me, and now I got up and started writing. Everything of Digenis and of his parents, wondrous deeds done by them. Therefore, I will start recanting. Vasileus the two-blooded and Cappadocian Akritis, to which parents he was brought forth, let everyone hear, and that all his ancestors were Christians, noble, virtuous, full of grace, of a royal race, renowned in all things, in regions of the east and in Romania, settled from the beginning in Cappadocia, from wondrous Syria, from a beautiful city. Of these wondrous and daring lords arose a wonderful king among them, very valiant and bold and rich by nature. Of the clan of Dukas he was of merit, Therefore his name is clearly known for me to say. Aaron he was called in the Syrian tongue, and Dronikos he was also called in Greek. This is the most wonderful and beautiful king, born in all desired by God and by men, just, irreproachable, firm, guiltless, and successful, living always according to God with his wife. She is of the same clan of Christian parents, of the same race of the royal family of the magistrates. Her name was again called Anna. They eloped and became parents of male children, and of the well-developed children, five brave children, only one of these he gave his soul and heart. The deprivation of female children stung like a sharp brooch. They prayed a lot to God and to the saints, and they have waited, so that by the grace of God, to be given the prodigious, wonderful female child they prayed for. But the prayers were granted, and the mistress conceived in her womb that there in due time she will have a wonderful child. And the king was present. He invited a seer, that he might speak the truth and reveal here, of the conception of the mistress and what daughter she will have. The seer, being wise and wonderful, cheerfully explained all truth to the king. Oh, most wonderful, noble, beautiful king, the mistress has conceived your female child, whose birth is of great joy to you, for she is truly female, says the prophecy. Be mindful of her when she is twelve years old. When the child reaches that age, be careful that she does not fall in love. For she is going to be taken by an emir as wife, snatched from her brothers and her parents, and he will become a Christian afterwards. But you shall build wondrous palaces for her, brisk and shining, full of grace, and put your daughter into these palaces, so that the thought of love shall lie elsewhere. When at the end of the cycle of nine months from the conception, the girl was born and out of this conception, the girl was born, exquisite and well-nourished, beautiful, snowy. Wherefore the king had great joy, and with him the mistress was happy with all. The people, Arhans, satraps, along with all the multitude, and she was baptized in the water of the holy pool, the girl called Irini by her parents. And she was raised as she ought to be every day by her and the Arhans' children's nannies, and shone like the sun in all splendors. When she was seven years old, then the king had great concern about how to preserve his daughter, lest by someone's love and bed she falls in love, and then she dies from receiving love. In a place full of grace, fresh air, and beauty, where there were cool trees, cool fountains, where there is a place abundant in water and snow cool fountains, where the nightingales sing, the swallows chant, the king commanded, and they built palaces. They built wonderful, three-storied, huge palaces. And in the glorious palaces that he built, he took his daughter there with many tears to avoid her receiving love. Three nannies were to be left with her. Twelve Arhan's children, fifty maids, she was commanded to learn her letters through her nannies, lest she be scattered to all her thoughts. Thirty Saracens, old guards, were given to keep watch round the doors, so that the arrow of love will surely not find ground, and pierce her heart and cast a desire. And in the greatness of those palaces, they have made a small steel locked door. And the king locked it by himself, turned it and barred it by himself. In the middle of it all, he built a patio. The patio, I believe, if you spot it, you might wonder at it and amaze your mind. Around that pool he built, out of silver he crafted peacocks and partridges, and cranes and parrots and swans and turtle doves, and the water sprang from that machine. Every one of the birds sang his own song. In another place, the living birds were singing, and those mechanical and inanimate birds were competing with the animate and living. Together they sang and gave life to their songs, and through the fair melody hearts were refreshed. And there was as if twelve islands inside the pool, and each island he planted each kind of tree, and each graceful tree had its place. They built her a bath in the middle of the patio, and you should admire the bathing machinery. They made in the bath a tub from brass, and outside the palace they built a furnace, and he made a large pipe of brass. 
From the furnace, it went into the bath, and the heating was pumped from the pipes, and heat bubbled into the tub, for the king never wanted at any time to grant Eros courtship. There came the twelfth year of the girl, which the seer prophesied for the girl, and she prevailed over the moon in every beauty. Like a wondrous cypress tree, she was of age. The movement was full of love, the spirit of love, and never seemed apparent to her to abhor it. She only thought about playing, smiling, and thus you know she was in an agitated state of mind. And from one place, she was again found in another. Her face shone as bright as a snowy crystal, a little flushed, as if it was purple. Her eyes were jet black, as if they were secretly laughing. Desire drips from her every blink, full of sweetness of love's grace, and they were always surrendered to love. From the quick movements she had when playing, the desire that she had to be loved is revealed, and in her lie the pearl of love. And every youth was shot by her in the depths of their hearts, for she had a wondrous figure and shone like the sun. And as love reached her from top to bottom, her spirit, mind, and sensations immediately turned soulless, numb. Her eyelids were wondrous, as if painted. She had a fair head, and the length of her hair, and her hairs were beyond her ears. She also had plump lips. Painted red and ready for a kiss, and a fountain of grace flowed from them. Round and shapely was her face, and pearly toothed, and she was a child of grace. Her neck was fair, as were all her limbs, and these were the beauties of the girl. And all the other possessions she had, who can count? Before she received the instruction on love's graces, around her she saw the bow of love, and afterwards much harm befell her. She saw the painting, and the girl wondered. Eros was painted as a child, reddish, youthful, tender. He looked like an apple. He held a powerful bow, large strength, and his arrow crept up on a youth. The youth stood with great solicitude. He had his breast bare, arrow in his heart, and she marvelled at Eros, how he was a winged man, and set before her maids and her Argon's children, "Who is this terrible, horrible, and great, powerful and mighty and great from sight, and how he holds in his hands?" How bow and arrows and pen and paper, and he wants to write, and he seizes the necks of the manly and women, and the fair maidens he holds like doves. He is very terrible and a tyrant, like an insolent, untamed, indolent, bloodthirsty lion, having great power over all men. And one of her maids answered grimly, "Him whom you behold, mistress, and your mind marvels at, of great power, of great terror. Every one names him Eros the Heartbreaker." None has ever escaped the blazing bow, for they have become slaves thrice, the young and the old. And if he leaves, he will quickly fly with his wings and send fire and thunder into one's heart, shoot him in the heart, and cast him into Hades. And if he be born kind, and he appears to him many times, he binds and enslaves him, makes him poor. He takes paper and writes the slave to be his, that he will always be a slave, a slave in bondage. And whoever falls into his hands, and wherever he gets to know him, he quickly loses his mind and lets go of his life. As she heard from the maid the words about Eros and laughed at him erotically, she spoke, "I do not fear the tyranny of Eros nor his power, even if he has the strength of a lion and is a flame bearer." The sun set and evening came, and the girl entered her chamber and went to sleep. That dreadful Eros advanced against her, casting the arrow at her and kindling a flame. It pierced her heart. Consuming her in fire, with anger he said as she slept, "Tell me how you dare to see my face, and you have not awakened your soul that your heart may be troubled. You have not fallen at my feet to beseech me. In the book I wrote on the page of slaves, I wrote you as a slave in it, and I have you as a slave. And first I compared you with your peers. You wanted to avoid desire, you shall have it. Something none had dared in the present world, and you will not lament, girl, nor know what it is." Nor has your heart been in pain, nor have you been engulfed in flames. My soul is in pain for you. Your beauty I pity. Do not in time quench yourself by too much love. I nursed you and trained you for love. If you flee, I have wings. I will quickly catch you. You see the flames which I carry to consume you. You see the arrows which I carry to shoot you. If you disobey the bondage which you have in your mind, I will call the torture of love and betray you. You will suffer the pestilence and observe well. This is what the soul slayer Eros spoke in her sleep. He shook his wings, made a great noise, scared the girl, and he left. The girl woke up from fear, and then all her maids rushed to her. The Arhon's children came, surrounded her, and she recounted the dream, the terrible dream. And after the tale was told with much fear, the girl came to Eros, whom she had seen painted, besieged and worshipped him, kissed him countless times. She groaned, she wept, and said before him, "Oh, Eros." 
mighty, fearful one, golden winged one, who has much power and tugs hearts. I fear your authority, I fear your wrath, and your terrible power I cannot bear. I beseech you from henceforth, and have sympathy on me, and in this where I have wronged you, have sympathy on me. My opinion which I have shown you, do not judge me, that by my own fault and ignorance you are despised by me, sovereign master. I have never intended you to treat me like that, and for that I unreasonably addressed you as such. Therefore, if I have wronged you, have sympathy on me, Eros. And at the beginning you made me suffer, but now I have mercy on me. Your servant I have entirely become, that you should not deny it. These words, therefore, the girl said, before horrible Eros and other similar things. She didn't know what would be born out of so much love. She had the flame of Eros and the flame of love, and from the multitude of fire her mind was scattered. Like the good brave men who were Palikaria, whom she always saw as precious gems, she always liked games and played by dancing. She has a glass throne in the cage where she is. She sits on the glass throne and observes, and she was decorating her beauty, which she had on her face. Her eyes were the sun, her eyebrows the moon, and her beauty was lovely. White as snow, who saw such a lean girl like a tender flower? She shone at night like a very shiny gem. Who has the grace to be a white pearl and to stand as a pure dove, to pick the good palikaria like gems? For she was a tender youth, a lean twelve-year-old, valiant and fair, as pure as the air. She would blow and fight like a mighty lioness who has tender eyes and strong palikaria. She was a fair, beautiful, and tender girl who grew up in the cage like a fresh partridge. So far, this is the upbringing, yes, of the wondrous girl. And she begins and calls the young man and speaks. He is beautiful and tender, like a refreshing rose, tall and lean, like a wondrous cypress tree. And she had a separated love, like a good turtle dove. She held a firm opinion that through marriage there will be joy. We will put an end to the first book and be done with this part to begin the second portion about the marriage. The second book is brought forth of the mother of the Akritas and how she was taken by the Emir from her parents and how the brothers of the girl made war, defeated the Emir and made him their brother-in-law and returned home and went through the marriage. The second book of the Guineas. When at last she reached a marriageable age, the all-beautiful girl, that beautiful one, she was an obstacle to desire. How then was she inflamed by the flame of love, which created women's familiarity with men? The father went on some trip, it was he who was sent to assemble the men, and she asked her mother to let her leave the house, and before going on a walk the girl spoke. The mother did not disobey the words of her most dear, but she provided horses and four-wheeled wagons, and in the wagon she put goods and drink, and sent with her the maids that she had, and taking chosen slaves with Archon's children, these things the desired daughter took on the road, and in a wondrous place the girl dismounted. At that time, the great Emir, who was called Mosur and grew up in Syria, in good Babylon, the great city, in those lands he began his great deeds, and for the bravery and goodness and prudence which he had, and the chiefs of Syria debated. They appointed him sultan and made him a chief, gave him three thousand Turks and Arabs, they made him leader of all of Syria, and taking his youths, came to Romania. They then ravaged the cities of the Romans, with much force, and they came before the place where the girl was playing and dancing and singing. And alone the emir seized the girl, and came to the valley, greatly impressed. And the men seized the slaves. They immediately followed the emir. And the brothers, when they heard what happened to the beautiful girl, they came to their mother, brought her the tidings. And then the first of her sons, that is, Constantinos, straight away mounted, put on his arms, his mother said to him, My sweetest son, go forth unto the emir to fight him, and don't let noises, blows, threats shock you. Do not fear death rather than mother's curse. Watch out for mother's curse when they cut you in pieces, and when all five of you are dead, then let them take her. Just set out eagerly against the emir's daring. With the help of God, the only one capable of helping, I have reassurance from him that you will take back your sister. And he, after listening to his mother's words, took his black horse and went to the emir, and after him came his brothers following him. They were mounting on horses and equipping armor. And when the emir saw young Constantinos, the girl's full brother who came to him, he mounted a piebald and starred horse. In front on its forehead it had a golden star. Its four hoops were trimmed with silver. It was shod with silver nails. A green and rose eagle was behind him in the saddle painted with solid gold. His arms glittered with sun rays, and his beard gleamed like Venetian gold, and everyone came out at once to watch the battle. The horse was in playing and amazed everyone. In one spot gathering his four legs, exactly as if it were staying there, or at other times it often appeared to trot delicately, and it seemed not to walk but fly over the ground. And he, the emir, delightfully laughed, 
and straightaway cried out, saying these words. After many wars and trials, again I accept to take on this one. When his servant heard him, a Saracen, he said, O Emir, do not mock him, do not scoff at him. I see him as a fine man and mighty in war. I fear lest the youngster, from his great daring, takes his sister and all our victories. But go fight him, and perhaps you can be victorious. Immediately, they took their horses, came to the battlefield. They hissed like serpents, roared like lions, and like flying eagles, the two clashed, and the spears exchanged thrusts, both broke, and one could not throw the other off their horse, and the swords were drawn and blocked each other and fell. They hacked at each other for many hours, and then you see the fine Palikaria fighting, and from the great many noises, the plains grew fearful, the mountains echoed, and the hills thundered, and sweat fell onto their armor straps. The black horse of Constantinus was speedier, and the wondrous youth was the rider, and with his rod struck the emir a great blow, and then he began to tremble like a coward. As the Saracens saw this unexpected sight, they greatly admired the youth, they said with one voice to the emir, Do not tremble, our master, do not be a coward. Just seize the elster quickly to be victorious, so that he doesn't take your head off with his frequent turns. And I don't know how you will conquer death, but don't let him boast how you routed an army, and ask for a truce to leave behind the fighting, for he is very powerful, lest he overwhelms you. And straight away the emir turned right away to flight, and he who boasted much was beaten by the youth, for there exists no good in boasting much. He threw his sword away, put his hands in the air, and showed his anger according to the custom they had, and immediately to the youngster he said these words. Cease, good youth, victory is yours to possess. Come, get your sister out of captivity. He didn't finish his words, he turned away in shame, and all the brothers were filled with joy. They raised their hands on high and gave thanks to God. All the glory, they said, to thee alone is due of all things, for may he who sets his hope in thee never be put to shame. They embraced their brother with great delight. Some kissed his hands, others his head. The five mounted and ran to the emir, and they spoke to him, implored him, O emir and leader of all Syria, Give us back your sister as you promised, and don't embitter the souls as you promised. Comfort the hearts weighed down with grief. Then again the emir, without speaking the truth, said, Take my seal, search the tents, and search all the tents and encampments, and when you find her and take her, you will receive her. And with much joy they received the seal, not knowing the deceit, searched the tents, and searching everywhere they didn't find their sister, and because they didn't find her, they began to weep again. When returning to the emir in much grief, a Saracen peasant they met on the road said to them through their interpreter, Whom do you seek, counselors, and for whom are you mourning? They answered and said the cause. You have captured a girl, our sister now, and not finding her, we don't want to live any more. Sighing, the Saracen said these words, Come down to the omni-shaped ditch to see. Yesterday we slaughtered some noble beauties, because they didn't listen to us. And when they heard this, they were in great grief. They took a lot of time, as they were lost in thought. They barely came to their senses and dried their tears. They turned the rings to the streams, arrived at the ditch. Many slain females they found, dripping with blood. Some lacked hands, others their heads, others legs were cut off. Some had no limbs at all and their guts out, unable to be recognized by any man. And having beheld this, dismay seized them. They stretched out their hands, picked up the heads, and they looked at the faces to recognize their wondrous sister, whom they sought. And as they didn't find her, they at once took the dirt, poured it on their heads and began to weep. Wailings were stirred and mournings from their hearts. They beseeched the sun and said as such, O oh, radiant sun, you who gives light to the world, show us our sister who was among them, and we will weep and bury her with the others. Which head to take, which hand to hold, and what reason shall we give to our good mother, and how she will lament and pull her hair? Son, why have you caused us this great evil? From henceforth it does not suit us to see this world. And it's not only her soul that they took away from her, but they destroyed her beauty. She became unrecognizable, and we see corpses. Her we do not see. But, O oh, sister most longed for, how are you condemned? Woe unto us, the humbled ones, you have left the world, and when your soul left, so did your beauty. How did you set before your time and extinguish our light, cut into pieces by barbarian hands? How was the hand of the merciless one not caught, of the one who didn't have compassion on your delightful youth? Truly a noble soul, from living dishonorably, preferred an honorable death to the pernicious life. O oh, sister, charming soul and heart, how will we distinguish you from the other corpses? And how do we procure this small consolation? So whoever slaughtered you sent you to Hades. O oh, villain cruelty, foreign violence. How, magnanimous girl, did you undergo this transgression of the law? Receive the many lamentations, girl, of your brothers. You were our only consolation in this world. And we are of good faith that you died a virgin in the end. 
After they wept for her, they buried all the victims at once, and they turned back, returning to the emir, and directly the five of them drew their swords, and face to face they all addressed them. O oh, emir, first emir and dog of Syria, our sister you have abducted, don't deprive us of her, and if you acted lawlessly, you will be killed in all ways. None of us wants to leave without her, but we'd sooner all be slain for our sister. They shed warm tears from the innermost of their hearts. Upon hearing this, the emir was greatly afraid. He asked them, Who are you and where are you from? Which family of Romania are you from? And then the eldest brother replied accordingly. We, emir, he said, happen to be originally from an eastern land of noble parents, and our father Aaron is from the Dukas clan, descended from the wondrous Kinamans, and the wondrous Musulam, the father of our father. And our mother is of the Lord Magistrates. They were called Magistrani, of these rich people. We have twelve uncles and six cousins. Our father was exiled for some follies. He is going to the frontier lands to gather men. If these people encounter you, you will no longer see the world. None of us happen to be at the kidnappings. And if we happened to be present, this wouldn't have happened. And nor would our sister have been snatched by your hand. And you wouldn't have even approached our home. Five brothers our mother bore, as you see, and we have one sister, the beam of the sun, and with her we have been blessed in this world. And now, you, return as our sister. Don't you know that we are sending men of our own to fetch our troops who are on campaign, to come back, and our father was also on campaign, who has spent due time in exile, to seek after you in the empire, and to come upon you wherever you may be, for it is inconceivable for us to drop the deed you have done us all, all of us bearing witness. And then answer the emir. I, excellent youths, young and valiant, am son of Chrysoherpos and of Spathia. My father died, leaving me as a young son. I was sent by my mother to my Arabic uncles. They raised me with endless ambitions. Ambron was my grandfather, Karo is my uncle, and seeing me fortunate in all my wars, made me govern over all of Syria, gave me three thousand elite men. All of Syria I subdued, captured Kufa, and Heracleon I pillaged, Amorion and Neferion, and never have I been frightened by armies and beasts. A sister vanquished me, whom you now seek. She is indeed the woman that you all know, and for this reason I irritated you so I could know. Her beauty inflames me, tears consume me. She never ceases to weep and mourn for you. And now that I have confessed and told the truth, if you agree to make me your brother-in-law, I will deny my faith and come to Romania. No one believe in this truth. She has not given me a kiss, I swear by the glorious prophet. She only sighs for you day and night. Enter my tent, you will find her. There immediately, listening with joy, lifted the tent and entered it, and they found a delightful bed adorned with gold, set on the ground, and there lay the girl. They sprinkled the ground with many tears, from hearts gnawed with immense sorrow, when she saw her brothers who suddenly came in, and as if succumbing to the unmeasured sorrow, she rose again from the couch and came before them, and with amazement kissed them. The unexpected joy and hope were also carried out with tears of sorrow and pain, as she embraced them with delight. They shed tears, lamenting greatly. The youths addressed these morning words to the girl. You live, captured sister, our soul and heart. We thought you dead and ripped by the sword. We supposed you were one of the dead, but you owe your life to your beauty, sister. For the infinite beauty soothes the sorrow and makes enemies spare the young and the beautiful. Then they assured the emir by oath that they will take him as brother-in-law to come to Romania. They sounded the trumpets, turned straight back. Everyone was amazed, saying to one another, Oh, wonders that we see, due to the power of love, how it delivers captives, stops armies, persuades one to deny faith, not fear death. And it was heard throughout the world that a fair girl with her lovely beauty routed the famous armies of Syria. And when they gave oaths to take him as brother-in-law, the emir immediately gathered his armies, returned to Romania with the girl, and when they reached the territory of Romania, the emir freed all his captives, gave each of them provisions sufficient on the way, and the brothers of the girl wrote to their mother about their sister's discovery, the emir's desire, for which he denied his faith and parents and friends. Our mother have no grief. We found the groom fine and all, of great handsomeness, prepare what is necessary for the wedding. And when the mother heard, she praised the Lord. Glory, my Christ, she said, to thy loving kindness, glory to thy power, hope of the hopeless, all thy willing, nothing is impossible for thee, for thou hast made the enemy tame, and hast delivered my daughter from captivity. O oh, daughter, most beloved, light of my eyes, when shall I see you alive, hear again your voice? Behold what is necessary for your marriage, that I am preparing in the best way, if your spouse is equal to you in beauty and possesses the mindset of noble Romans. I fear, my good child, that he may be loveless, and fierce as a heathen chooses not to look after you. And the general's wife joyfully sang, 
Meanwhile, the emir, and with him the girl's brothers, gladly together took the troublesome road, and when they came near their own house, many people and kin came out to greet them, the general's wife with great glory. The infinite joy which occurred, what words could wholly describe, wholly imagine? The children embraced with mother with longing, and the mother also rejoiced with her children, like fulfilling the words of David, the co-rejoicing of mother and children. And seeing her son-in-law very beautiful in shape, she offered thanks to God with all her heart. Christ, my God, she said, light, whoever has faith in thee, shall never fail to achieve what they desire. And coming to the house which they had, and with the holy baptism in the holy baptismal pool administered to the groom, they celebrated the marriage, and so increased the universal joy. For the emir rejoiced to have come upon his loved one, and there is no greater joy than passionate love. And the more blamed the lover is by unsuccess, the more the lover will rejoice in having his beloved. And after the union, the girl conceived and bore the noble Vasileus Theocritus, and the emir's desire increased yet more, for he was inflamed by Eros who triumphs over all. End of the second book of the Unisocritus.